Hello and welcome to the Genius of Invention. I'm Michael Mosley. I'll be exploring some of the greatest inventions in history and the geniuses behind them. I'll be joined by industrial archaeologist Dr. Cassie Newland and Professor of Engineering Mark Miodovnik. And together we'll be uncovering the story of invention and Britain's role in shaping the modern world. We are a restless lot. In our lifetime, on average, we travel half a million miles. That's the equivalent of going around the world 20 times. And the reason we can do that is because of a series of brilliant inventions. In this programme, we're going to take a look at the geniuses that brought the unimaginable shock of speed and the ability to travel anywhere in the world into our daily lives. Since classical Greece, inventors have been trying to use high-pressure steam to create movement. Where others failed, our first genius, Cornishman Richard Trevithick, finally succeeded. He built the world's first full-scale working steam locomotive and paved the way to mass transport, which has redefined the way we live. This is the atmospheric steam engine, the invention that kick-started the Industrial Revolution. And this is a steam locomotive, the invention that allowed that revolution to explode by transforming our ability to move people and things. They're both called steam engines, but they are utterly different machines and rely on entirely different technology. Railway locomotion required the taming of a dangerous power source that people have been trying to master for quite some time. The breakthrough when it occurred did not come out of one of our fine universities, but emerged from the mind of a maverick who was living here in one of the more remote parts of the United Kingdom. In the late 18th century, the Cornish countryside was dotted with steam engines, used to pump water from copper and tin mines. They don't work the way modern steam does. In these machines, water is boiled, and when it condenses, creates a vacuum that harnesses the power of atmospheric pressure to pull down a giant beam. Atmospheric steam engines transformed mining, but they were enormous and only supplied a limited amount of power. Most of these engines were built by inventor James Watt and his business partner, Matthew Bolton. Their machines all contained something called a separate condenser, which was protected by a strict patent. Any engine fitted with a separate condenser burnt much less coal. And in a county like Cornwall, with no coal resources, this was absolutely critical. The trouble was, if you used this engine, you had to pay a monthly royalty to Bolton and Watt. At one time, there were 45 Bolton and Watt engines in this area alone, and the owners all paying royalties, which they deeply resented. So Cornwall became a place of inventive resistance or, if you were Bolton and Watt, a place that was awash with piratical plagiarizers. If they could invent a new type of steam engine that didn't infringe Watt's patent, they could avoid paying royalties. A young engineer called Richard Trevithick set out to do just this. Richard Trevithick's school report was amusingly awful. A disobedient, slow, obstinate, spoilt boy, frequently absent and very inattentive. They also noticed, however, that he was good at arithmetic and arrived at solutions in an unusual way. And it was this desire to do things unconventionally that meant Richard Trevithick achieved great things. Trevithick's plan was to build an engine that worked in an entirely new way, one that did not rely on atmospheric pressure and instead used high-pressure steam to physically drive a piston. A high-pressure steam engine wouldn't need a separate condenser. There was just one problem. Everyone thought it was impossible. Why hadn't people built high-pressure steam engines before? The public and even engineers uh, like Watt thought that uh, this was too dangerous to continue with, and uh, he'd never managed to conquer high-pressure steam himself. And uh, he'd failed. He knew that high-pressure steam would blow up the containers it was in, and he thought that Trevithick was going down that track as well, and it was only going to end up in a disaster and someone was going to be killed. Undaunted, Trevithick set out to build a high-pressure steam engine that wouldn't blow up. His first challenge was the boiler. No one had managed to build one that could withstand the massive pressures required. But Trevithick had a secret weapon. His father-in-law was a master blacksmith. With his help, Trevithick was able to build a new shape of boiler, 
a cylindrical version, robust enough to contain steam at dangerous pressures. So what's the main difference between this and Bolton and Watt's steam engine? Terrific went for high pressure, and it was pushing on the pistons directly. In this case, a double-sided piston, so it's pressure on the top and bottom, and it drove the piston as opposed to the atmospheric pressure. And there are other innovations here as well, aren't there? Yes. He's preheated the boiler feed water, and most importantly, he's put the fire actually inside the boiler. An inventor driven by economic need to get round a costly patent ended up achieving something that other inventors had been trying to do for centuries. Trevithick's engine was more powerful than Watts and a fraction of the size. And so he could put it on wheels. The age of steam locomotion had begun. Once Trevithick had shown how to use high-pressure steam, other inventors were able to use this knowledge to build stronger, faster, more efficient engines, creating something that previously could only be imagined, powered travel. Trevithick did not make a lot of money or achieve great fame, but he did have the soul of an inventor. Just before he died, he wrote to a friend, I have been branded with follies and madness, but I have the secret satisfaction of knowing that what I did was new, useful, valuable, and to me, that is worth far more than any riches. Richard Trevithick's high-pressure steam engine required a couple of really clever innovations. Now, since they also involve water, fire, and the threat of explosions, we thought it would be better to go outside, despite the fact that it is raining and very cold. <laughs> OK, Mark, demo number one. What have yes, you got here? I'm multitasking. I'm making us a cup of tea, which is very needed, and I'm also going to show how Trevithick's made his boilers much more efficient. So his kettle number one, totally normal kettle with some water in it, his kettle number two, but with a fire tube in the middle. And this is a, a tube that goes from bottom to top, and it's one of Trevithick's best inventions. It's, it's incredibly banal, isn't it? I mean, really, just sticking a bit of metal. It's not very clever. You say that, but it's going to make this kettle boil so much faster, and actually he made his boilers revolutionary. So it seems like an obvious thing to do, but that's <laughs> all great ideas are a bit like that, aren't they? They seem obvious in retrospect. So what happens is, because you've got a tube down the middle, you've got the hot air from the flame, it's in contact with much more water. So you've got, in a sense, a much faster boiler. OK, and your prediction, presumably, this one's going to boil before that one? It's not just a prediction. Come on. <laughs> it's going to happen. OK, OK, Cathy, what have you got for me? Well, the other really major innovation in Trevithick's boilers is the, the shape of the boiler itself. Now, if you can imagine, high pressure water wants to get to a spherical shape, so the ideal shape for a boiler is spherical. Now, they're practically impossible to manufacture, so the second best thing you can do is a cylinder. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine, this is the Bolton and Watt shape boiler. Yep. This is Trevithick's new nice cylindrical boiler, and this is high pressure steam. Get pumping. Okay, so you... I represent you hot wanna... burning flames. Do yeah, I? hot, hot burning, exploding. Oh, it's dangerous, flames. is it? Potentially yeah. dangerous. Could <laughs> well, blow up in our faces. Well, it's a high pressure experiment. Okay. okay, and what we're going to see is as you add extra pressure to this box, yeah. we're putting it under a pressure test. So both of them are under equal pressure. Yep, same thickness, same capacity, same amount of water going in. Something so if, should happen. If you imagine trying to do high pressure steam with Bolton and Watts box, this is what would happen. Okay. All the water inside is trying to get to being a sphere inside yep. a cube. So the sides begin to bulge, the welds around the edge Ooh. begin to crack. And you can see it's that... It's beginning to hiss, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's beginning to... Oh, oh, look, there's a leak down here. You're there's... safe to do it. Oh, don't get too close. Is this I looking mean, ominous? Oh, it's beginning to go, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, if that was high-pressure steam, you'd imagine it just jetting out, basically broiling you. <laughs> so this is why it's Oh, there you go. If you can see the squirt coming yeah. out of there. It's absolutely spraying out here now. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, this stuff is cold, but uh, if that was hot steam, then I would be, be scalded alive. This is really very, very impressive, I have to say, because this one is absolutely spraying away. This one, the Trevithick machine, if you like, the Trevithick boiler is completely intact. And good old James Watt is leaking like... Well, he's leaking I've like... I've got some steam over here too, guys. Tea's ready. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Like that. We like tea. That worked. <laughs> Look. Really impressive. <laughs> I love it when... Woo! This one's going, this one's not going. You're yes. right, Mark. <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, to be honest, Trevithick, a cup of tea? Yeah. Love it. One for you, one for me, one for you. One for Mark, there it goes. Now, all the, f all the other people who, who followed him after this, they all used these fire tubes. They stuffed their boilers with them. Stevenson, a lot of them, they, they just love this invention. Richard Trevithick, what a guy. In 1801, Cornishman Richard Trevithick discovered how to make steam locomotion achievable and opened up the possibility of powered long distance travel. But it would take a fellow Brit, George Stevenson, to turn it into something really practical, something world-changing, as Cassie has been finding out. This is Skirm Bridge in County Durham. 
It might not look very important, but it holds a pivotal place in world transport history. If you'd been stood here on the 27th of September, 1825, you'd have witnessed one of the most remarkable spectacles of the Georgian era. It was the first time the public took a trip by steam railway. Like many great inventors, Stevenson was an improver. His engine was based on Richard Trevithick's original, but where Trevithick had had one fire tube, Stevenson had the brilliant idea of filling the boiler with them. This created much more power, and Stevenson was convinced this finally meant the steam train was viable. By the early 18th century, Britain was dependent on coal, and County Durham had plenty of it. But moving it to our fast-growing cities was expensive and slow. As demand grew, the pit owners around Darlington knew a quicker method had to be found. In 1820, the promoters of the new line met here. They believed an iron road was needed for horses to pull wagons of coal to the river at Stockton. They employed local engineer George Stevenson to build their new wagonway, but his ideas were more ambitious. So, this is Stevenson's line, but he's just an engineer at a colliery, so how does he get involved? Well, George Stevenson is a notable local character, right? He's from uh, uh, the area. He likes the idea of steam locomotives. He has been developing them for a few years. He's improving their design, and he realises that horses are not the future for railways, that uh, steam locomotives are, but they are, of course, heavier uh, than uh, the coaches that horses pull, and so it needs a better conditioned track, it needs better foundations, better sleepers, and so on. And so uh, he improves the track in order to facilitate the use of locomotives. Stevenson's real genius was to see the entire railway as one vast, complex entity. He didn't just improve engine efficiency, he brought in new construction methods and developed brand new materials. Now, Stevenson's rails ugh, are made of malleable wrought iron instead of brittle cast iron, and this meant that the heavy weight of the locomotive could be supported without cracking the rails. On the 27th of September 1825, the new line opened with Stevenson's locomotion number one pulling 30 wagons, most for coal, but a select few reserved for people. Stevenson saw the opening of the line as an opportunity to prove that steam was superior to horsepower. Some accounts say that 600 people piled into the wagons pulled by locomotion number one. It would have been bumpy and uncomfortable, but imagine seeing it for the first time. What a way to travel. Stevenson's train was an enormous success. Within a decade, a million tonnes of coal was being transported along the line every year. The future of the steam locomotive was no longer up for debate. The Stockton and Darlington Railway had a far greater impact than just lowering the price of coal. By marrying the train to the tracks, George Stevenson not only developed a better way of moving goods, he established a revolutionary new method of travel which transformed the British landscape. The invention of the steam locomotive brought us the railways. For the first time, people and goods could move about with ease, and Britain became the world leader in manufacturing and industry. But of course, the rest of the world was also busy innovating, and when the next great transport invention came along, it wasn't British, it was German. The steam locomotive started the transport revolution, but had its limitations. The engines were enormous and extremely inefficient. Trevithick had increased efficiency tenfold by putting the furnace inside the boiler. But what would happen if you took that thought one step further and removed the boiler altogether? By the mid-19th century, inventors all across Europe were trying to do just this. The race was on to build a working internal combustion engine. This proved incredibly difficult until 1876, when Nicholas Otto designed the four-stroke engine. It creates movement from fuel combustion acting directly on the moving parts. Most engines today are still based on his model, and it led to the most popular form of transport ever, the car. But why did it take so many people so long to succeed? Internal combustion is about five times more efficient than external combustion. It works by mixing fuel and air to create an explosion that physically moves the piston. But you can't use coal to do it. It burns too unevenly and leaves too much residue. The internal combustion engine took so long to get right because inventors like Otto had to wait for chemical engineers to discover how to distill new liquid fuels from oil. 
once we had kerosene, diesel and petrol, internal combustion could finally work. Petrol is volatile, which means it goes from being a liquid to a gas extremely readily, and that makes it a perfect fuel for the internal combustion engine. It burns, producing a huge explosion, and leaves hardly any residue. But it was a big step going from Otto's discovery to creating a car, as Cassie has been finding out. Long distance travel may have been transformed by the train, but inside Britain's cities, it was millions of working horses that provided transport. But this was all about to change, when in 1886, a German engineer invented a controversial new machine. This is the world's first motor car. It's called the Benz Patent Motor Wagon. It's built by Carl Benz, who's the son of an engine driver. It's got three wheels, this kind of tiller arrangement for steering, and the engine behind me gives you an average speed of nine miles an hour, which from up here feels a lot more like 90. But Benz could never have built the car without Otto's innovative engine design. It was all to do with how the fuel burned. And the, the crux of it is this. You have a cylinder with a piston, just like any other working engine, but these cams very carefully control how the fuel and air mixture is let into and out of the cylinder, the four-stroke cycle. So what he manages to do is smooth out all those bumps and harness the explosive power of the fuel within the engine and turn that into a drive and a machine that doesn't just shake itself to bits. <laughs> and it was so successful, it was named the Otto Silent Engine. Otto's engine was designed to be stationary. It was Benz that made it move. And you've got everything you need here, all the things that you get in a car. You've got spark plugs and HT leads. You've got your drive belt. You've got a very early form of clutch that allows you to disengage the engine. You've got a battery in a box. You've got a tubular steel frame, which is exactly the same as on a Ferrari. It's everything you need to turn the dream of a car into reality. The problem was no one wanted to buy one. It was a surprise outing by Benz's wife, Bertha, that changed public opinion. She borrowed her husband's prototype and embarked on a 66-mile trip to her mother's house. She sounds quite a practical lady. She had a, a, an ignition failure with the ignition lead um, parted, and so she took a hat pin or hair grip, I'm not sure which, but she put it inside the wire and then insulated it with a garter. Cool. Bertha's journey soon became famous, proving to the world the car could replace the horse. Benz's invention finally took off. In 1900, horses pulled almost all vehicles on London streets. 15 years later, horse-drawn transport has virtually disappeared. And now we have more than a billion cars on our roads worldwide. Otto's genius and Benz's vision led to one of the most extraordinary transformations of the 20th century. When cars first came on the market, they were incredibly expensive. Only the rich could afford to buy them. If they were going to change the world, then they had to come down in price. Often it's not the invention itself that matters, it's the manufacturing process behind it. The explosion of invention during the Industrial Revolution transformed consumer demand. Whatever the product, we wanted more of it, and we wanted it quicker. This meant we had to change the way we made things, and it was the car that paved the way. While the car companies of Europe were building a small number of vehicles by hand, American Henry Ford decided to do things a little differently. He saw the potential of this new invention and decided everyone, given the chance, would want to own one. He had to find a way to make it cheaper. In 1913, Ford opened the world's first continuous moving assembly line. It built only one model, the Model T. Ford's innovation was that assembly workers remained stationary while the car was moved by a system of pulleys and conveyor belts. The process was divided into 84 steps, and the same worker repeated the same step as each car moved through. With hundreds of workers all repeating one task on hundreds of cars, building time was slashed from a few days to just an hour and a half. The rest is history. An affordable car became the most popular form of transport ever. Now, 60 million are produced every year. Ford's methods have changed the way we make everything, from cars to jet engines. By the 1920s, cars were rolling off production lines across the world. But there was another outlet for manufacturers' skills, aviation. 
In the aftermath of World War I, Britain had the biggest air force in the world, and the government poured money into military innovation. So car companies were quick to spot an opportunity and started building engines for aeroplanes as well. But to truly conquer the skies would take a leap of real genius, as Mark explains. This is a propeller. Until 1941, if you wanted a plane that flew, you had to have one. The Wright brothers had a chief flight in 1903 by adding propellers to a basic internal combustion engine. It worked by converting the up and down motion of the piston to a rotary motion to create propulsive force. Rolls-Royce made some of the fastest in the world. The Merlin could fly at 374 miles per hour. But at this factory in Coventry, a young RAF pilot was about to revolutionise aviation completely. Frank Whistle believed his jet engine would take flight higher and faster than ever before. Born in 1907, Whittle was obsessed with planes from an early age. After joining the RAF, he gained a reputation as a daring fighter pilot. I met up with one of Whittle's original apprentices. The idea as a pilot in the RAF was to shoot down the opposition as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, two things you needed to do as a pilot was to get high because it gave you a big advantage over the enemy. And the second thing was to be uh, with speed. Whittle's experience as a pilot directly inspired his invention. The only way you could combine high speed and long range was by flying very high. See, the piston engine and propeller wouldn't because uh, uh, the thin air uh, affected the power to such an extent that uh, at, say, 40,000 feet, a piston engine wouldn't even turn itself round. Whittle knew a propeller engine limited flight. He had to find a new form of propulsive power. In 1930, he patented his design for the world's first jet engine. This is an original blueprint of Frank Whittle's jet engine. Anyone looking at it at the time would have been amazed because there's no propeller and no pistons. Instead, there's a turbine. And that's the turbine is in here. And what that's doing is compressing the air it's then mixed with the fuel and ignited, and out the back comes a huge thrust, like a rocket. And this was a quantum leap in aircraft engine design. The enormous compression created by the turbine meant that Whittle's engine could generate far more thrust than a propeller and piston system, and that meant a lot more power. No propeller also meant the plane could fly at much higher altitudes. But the design was so radical that not even the military believed it could work. This is so revolutionary for its time. And you're a manufacturer. And what he's asking is something that seems out of this world. But like all great inventors, Whittle refused to give up. He founded his own company, Power Jets. By 1937, he built a prototype and tests could finally begin. During early experiments, the jet engine was attached to this post. It ran at speeds of up to 16,500 revs per minute. In later years, Whittle re-enacted those same tests for the cameras. Whittle modified his engine for two years, and it became not just powerful and efficient, but also reliable. At last, the Air Ministry were impressed. RAF Cranwell, Lincolnshire, the 15th of May, 1941. The 17-minute flight is one of the most remarkable occasions in the history of aviation comparable only to the Wright brothers' first flight in its significance. Finally, Whittle's engine took to the skies. The jet age was upon us. I heard the whistling noise. Couldn't think what it was. When it got overhead, I noticed there wasn't a propeller. So I downed tools and ran in the house to tell everybody I'd seen an aeroplane without a propeller. Of course, nobody believed me. Well, people, of course, uh, thought that uh, it was a very great thrill for me uh, when it took off, but I can't honestly say that um, uh, there was a, a very great thrill attached to it. Uh, we just knew that it would fly, and there was uh, no reason why it shouldn't. I think it was a genius, but it came in a, in a natural way. As he got more and more interested in a project, the more and more knowledge it all became. And, of course, he was a very determined person. You give him something to do, and he would do it. In 1945, just a few years after that first test, the jet engine smashed the world speed record by flying at 606 miles per hour. Today, it's hard to imagine a world without the convenience of jet-powered flight. By allowing us to fly higher and faster and over longer distances, Frank Whittle's remarkable invention has shrunk the globe. But I'm still amazed at the audacity of the man. 
I mean, to put a turbine in the sky, that must have seemed madness at the time. But today, it's obvious. And that surely is the essence of genius. The need for speed has undoubtedly made the world a far smaller place. We can go huge distances in just a matter of hours. And that is thanks to the genius inventors who made the impossible possible.